I was asked just very recently if I would lead a Bible study through video with those of you who live in the Philippines, and I immediately said, yes, of course, I love those people. I mean, I, when I get to spend time with you a little bit ago, well, it was one week was way too short. I am looking forward to the day if God answers my prayers positively, I'm coming back. And I hope to be able to, those of you who are watching from the Philippines in this Bible study, and we have not met, I hope that one day we will. And those of you who are watching and we have met and we spent time getting to know each other and grow to love each other, I'm looking forward to deepening those relationships with you. And those of you who are watching from other parts of the world, and you're tuning in right now to a Bible study, we can all go together right now in Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. I thought, what on earth do I have to offer to these people who are gonna be involved in this Bible study by way of video? And I thought the most important thing that's happening in this world right now, with all of the racial conflicts, with all of the tension and stress involved in the coronavirus, COVID-19, and how it has shut down the world. And so many thousands of people have contracted the disease and many of them have died and many are living in fear. And I hope that today's Bible study will be an encouragement to all of you, like it has been to me, preparing for this study. So at the end of our time together, which is gonna be very brief, I'm gonna give you a few questions to ask and discuss with each other. And if you're not with anyone right now, you write down those questions and think about them and pray about them yourself. And then what I want you to do is pick out someone that you can spend some time with and communicate the things that you've learned, if you've benefited from anything at all from this study, that you will share this with someone else and that you will share this video with someone else. Feel free to take this and post it anywhere you want. Ephesians chapter two. Can you take just a moment with me and let's pray before we open up the Bible together? God of heaven, I pray that you will open our eyes to something new, something fresh that we can apply to our hearts, to our families, to our relationships with others, that we can apply in the kingdom and bring about a great amount of peace in this world. I pray, God, that you will remove, well, not remove stress, but to help us to deal effectively with the stress of this life. That you will remove the fear that many have because of the coronavirus. COVID-19 has brought our world to a standstill. And one of the things, God, that I am so pleased is that what's happening right now, many people are facing their own mortality. They realize that this life is short and it may be a virus, it could be an accident, it could be some other kind of a disease, it could be a fatal shooting from someone, it could be a stabbing from someone in the a, in a heat of a moment. We, our life can be taken immediately. God, we are far more aware of that now because of this virus than we've ever been before. And coming out of this, we also live in a world that has so much turmoil and strife and anger and hatred between countries, between peoples, between ethnic groups, between just because of the color of our skin. God, help us, please help us to see in this study what you have done to bring peace into the world. And we pray this in the name of our peace, Jesus Christ, amen. You say, pray this in the name of our peace. What are you talking about? Well, read the Bible with me. Ephesians chapter two, we're gonna start in verse one, and I'm going to read very rapidly the first 10 verses. And then we're going to focus a lot more attention from verses 11 to verse 22, but particularly how Jesus is our peace. Are you with me? Okay, let's read. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom we all once lived and in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I wanna highlight a couple of things here. Number one, you and I were lost, we were dead, we were separated from God. There was no hope, we had no help, and if God didn't make the move, we would be separated from him forever. We would receive his wrath, his total anger poured out on us because of our rebellion. But Jesus entered into the world. This is what verse four says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He died on a cross and he took our sins into his body. He paid the penalty for our sins so that through the death and the shedding of his blood, his burial and his resurrection, we would be able to have relationship with God through him accepting the gift that he gave us. Now that's good news because you see all of this is a gift. That's what grace means. It's a gift. It's something you don't earn, I don't earn, you can't earn. You can't do enough to earn God's forgiveness. But Jesus, who lived the perfect life, took our sins voluntarily into his body. Sometime in the future, I wanna go more deep into that and explain that, I think, more clearly so that you'll have a firm grasp. We all can have a firm grasp together about the forgiveness of God through Jesus on the cross. Many of us are confused about how on earth did that happen? And I emphasize that specifically. How on earth did that happen? That Jesus' death and the shedding of his blood would have anything to do with forgiveness of sins. How did God do that and why did God do that? Well, we're gonna get into that in the future, I hope, together. But right now, what I want you to see is that the cross of Jesus is the gift to us. Through the cross, through his death and his resurrection, we can have life, real life. Relationship with God, who is life, who is love, who offers peace. Now watch. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know what your Bible says right here in verse 10? Look at it again. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, we were not created by good works, but we were created for good works. You were saved by the grace of God. You were given life when you participated in his death, burial, and resurrection. When you were baptized, he washed your sins away and gave you new life through your own death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what this verse talks about, verses 1 through 11. We were dead in our sins, but God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him. That's Paul's baptism terminology, okay? So he's talking about when you were baptized here, and you receive the grace of God through faith. You trusted him, not yourself, 
and not how good, how good you could even become. You'll never be good enough. Would, can we agree on that? You, you, you can't be so good that God would finally say, okay, you can come to heaven now and spend forever with me. And you're not gonna be perfect in your knowledge. Is there anyone who has perfect understanding of scripture? Is there anyone who knows God perfectly? No. Is there anyone who is living a perfect life in all of their behavior, all of their attitude, all of their emotion, all of their personality? Is there anyone who is loving God out of everything they are perfectly? No. Well, if, you, if you're not perfect and you can't be perfect in your obedience, in your knowledge, is there anyone who has perfect faith? No. Well, if you can't have perfect faith, perfect behavior, perfect knowledge, then God saves you in your imperfection. And he's always going to save you in your imperfection, not based on how much you know, how much you believe, or how good you are. Rather, he's going to save you in your location. Watch it. In Christ Jesus. This is what it says. We are created in Christ Jesus. It is in Christ that we have anything from God. All that the Holy Spirit gives to us that belongs to us now because of Christ, all of that is because of our location. Our spiritual location is Jesus himself. I live in Jesus. You live in Jesus. See, the day you surrendered yourself to Jesus and you said, Lord, I want you to be my Lord. I give you my life. I trust you. Please save me. Please forgive me. And you were baptized. You were lowered under the water, buried with Christ, raised again out of that water. But see, it's not the water itself. It didn't clean your body. It's not because you're stepping into the water. It's because of an act of belief, of trust in the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. Water, yes, God commanded it. But it is your faith enacted in the resurrected Jesus Christ. By the way, that's 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 and 22. Baptism now saves you, not because it washes your body clean, but because it's an appeal to God for a clear conscience through Jesus raised from the dead. Okay, now, we're gonna focus the rest of our time on verses 11 through the end of this chapter because this is where we're gonna find peace, hope, joy. We're gonna find fellowship with each other and fellowship with God. So look at it with me. Therefore, because we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, therefore, remember that one time, you non-Jews in the flesh called the uncircumcision by the ones who are called the circumcision, which is really just flesh by hands. Remember that you, me, we all were at one time, at that time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We had nothing to do with God's people and the promises that God made in the covenant with Israel. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. No hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, you, we, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Say that with me, would you? Read it with me. For he himself is our peace. One more time. For he himself is our peace. Who, Jesus, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man 
in place of the two. So, watch, making peace. Jesus made peace by dying on a cross and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you, I, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but you, I, are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, the most valuable part of building a building, the strongest part of, the, of that upon which the whole building is built is the cornerstone, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom, Jesus, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now there's a lot said there, but I wanna draw this out and see if we can understand a little bit about what's happening, okay? So consider then the cross of Jesus. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, his hands were nailed and his feet were nailed. They were nailed to the cross, and there he died. He had the thorn of crown of thorns on his head, and Jesus died a slow, agonizing death on the cross. But what happened there, the miracle that happened there, that when Jesus died, God was placing all of our sin into his body so that when he died, our sin died with him. When we participate in Jesus and we surrender, this is me now coming to the cross of Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ on his cross when I give my life to him. My sins are forgiven. I'm buried with Christ and I'm raised again when Jesus was raised, I'm also spiritually raised to walk a new life in Jesus. In Jesus Christ, who is now my Lord. I'm going to live life under His direction in relationship with Him. It's not a matter of church and religion and worship. It is a matter of lifestyle, of walking with Him daily that brings about the importance then of fellowship with others in our worship and our times together. So here I am in Christ and my sins are forgiven. So through Jesus, I have relationship with God. Jesus gave me access to God, right? And now what it says, we have access to God through Christ. So. What Jesus did was create peace with God, between me and God. So at night, when I lay my head down on the pillow and I say, Lord, oh, I've, I've tried to live for you, but I failed. I can lay my head on the, night, on the pillow at night and say, thank you. Thank you, God. You have forgiven me and I continue to walk trusting you. Thank you. And I have peace, peace of mind. I have peace with God, which brings peace in my heart, a peace of mind. But here's where the real power of the cross as well is. It's not just between us and God, it's between us and us, our enemies. When others come to Jesus, whoever they are, they also are nailed to the cross of Christ. They are in the one body of Jesus. 
And that's what this is going to represent, is the one body of Jesus on the cross. He brought two groups together who can't stand each other. They hate each other. I don't know if you've been paying attention to our news in the United States, but we have groups of people in this country who hate each other politically, ethnically, by the skin color. We hate each other. And I say we generically. I don't hate anyone. Can't pr prove. I don't hate anyone. But there are people who hate one another. And Jesus takes these two individuals who hate each other. They can't stand each other. Oh, they, every time they think about each other, they want to kill the other one. But when they hear the good news, he responds. He responds. She responds. And she responds. They come, they've hated each other all this time, but now they both respond to Jesus. And where are they now? In Christ. He gives them peace in his own body. Now, the good news of this is, verse 14, Jesus, he himself is our peace. Peace is not going to come about because of some political election, because of some government, because of some constitution. We can have some peace whenever one country defeats another country. Perhaps there's peace in the world for a short time, but that's a forced peace. That still doesn't take, that, that doesn't take out of our heart hostility and anger and bitterness and, and hatred wanting to kill each other in our hearts. See, the law of God did not bring peace either, did it? It didn't do anything to change our heart. It didn't do anything to change our nature. But in Christ, we were recreated. Here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says. You can look it up later if you want. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he, she, is a new creation. All of the old is gone. Everything has become new. My friend, that is good news. You can start over, start fresh. Everything is brand new in Jesus. Not just brand new with you. You became a new person, a new creation. So did the one who you hated and who hated you. You both now are in Christ and he is our peace. Do you see that? Do you see that this is more than just peace with God and I go to church and I sing about it. This brings peace between people, between races, between ethnic groups, between people who have different colors of skin, between people who are naturally hostile to each other. In this case, Ephesians chapter 2, it's between the non-Jew and the Jew. They hated each other. But Jesus, in his death, brought those two people together and made, this is what it says, go back and look at it, he made one new man in his body. Now, let me translate that just for the 21st century. He made one new person in his body. We belong to each other because we belong to him. He gives us peace. He's made us family. So watch, we start there and then we work out our hostilities by growing to understand each other, by growing to appreciate each other, by determining, I decide, I'm going to be thankful for you and you're going to be thankful for me. I'm going to pray for you. You're going to pray for me. I'm going to work to make your life better. You're going to work to make my life better. We're going to work together. You on that side of the world, me on this side of the world, we wherever we are, we're going to work together to help everyone understand the good news of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. They can have the life that we've been given. Now that is powerful. Let me ask you these two or three questions and we're done. Number one, does this describe you in Christ? Have you surrendered yourself to Jesus? I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm not even talking about, have you been baptized yet? 
What I'm talking about is in your own heart, have you fully surrendered? Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord? None of us can fully surrender, okay? It's an impossibility to bring 100% of all of our life. But my heart is, Jesus, I'm gonna live for you. You died for me and now you're alive. You are Lord. I want you to be my Lord. Please forgive me. Take me into your, into your kingdom, into your family. Make me a part of your life. And as you're baptized into Christ, that prayer becomes your reality. In fact, baptism is a prayer to God. It's a surrendering of yourself. By the way, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 says we were dead. What do we do with dead people? That's right, we bury them. And then as you're buried under the water, sins are washed away. You're raised again to walk in a brand new life because you gave Jesus your life. You have relationship with him. So you have relationship with God the Father. What's good news about that now is now I'm asking you, have you done that? If you haven't, I'm going to encourage you to think about it, pray about it, and talk to someone about it. I want you to read your own Bible. Read through the book of Acts. Get to know Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read about who he is and how he lived and how he lives today in his church. Because the life that he lived is the life that he wants to live through us. Now, if you're, not, if you're serious about walking with him and serving Christ as your Lord, then the second question I want to ask is, who are the enemies in your life? Who are the ones that you would say hate you? Who despise you? Who can't get along with you? Who are the ones that you hate? You despise. You can't get along. I'm going to ask you to do one thing first of all. Name those people and then pray for them. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. I mean, they're the ones who hurt you. Pray for them. When you start praying for someone else, it does something to your own heart toward them. You feel a greater, I don't know, you start to feel like God does toward them. You start to think about them like God does. And when you start thinking about them the way God does, you'll start feeling toward them the way God does. You will love them too, and you'll start doing things for them. God created you in Christ Jesus for good works. And that's toward the ones who are your enemies. Paul even, or rather Jesus, told his followers that if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn to the other one. If someone forces you to carry their stuff for one mile, carry it two miles. Go the extra mile. Show love. What, is it, what good is it if you only love people who love you? Jesus said. Love others. You will be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think that's what that passage, the last one, is a perfect tense. It's not command, it's a perfect tense. You will be, it's a future tense rather. You will be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect when you love like this. Now, what's good about all of this is, is this one thing. When you're right with God, you're right with you. When you're right with God and you're right with you, you can be right with other people. But you cannot really truthfully be right with others until you're right with God and you're right with yourself. You love God and you love yourself. You're at peace with God, you're at peace with yourself. So when God forgives you, you forgive you. And even if your enemy doesn't ask to be forgiven, have you forgiven? I want you in your mind, in your heart, and we're going to talk about this later, okay? This is a future Bible study we'll have together. But I want you in your mind, in your heart, I want you to take those people who have hurt you and who you have every reason to hate. I want you to take them and nail them to the cross with Jesus and say, in Jesus, I forgive you. In your own mind, in your own heart, nail that person and that sin, whatever they did to hurt you, to the cross because it's only in Jesus that we can have peace and forgiveness. Those are the two or three questions I wanted you to discuss. You have others in that Bible passage you can continue to talk about, but those are the ones I wanted to focus on today because you see, our world needs peace. 
We need peace with God. Our problem is not political. Our problem is spiritual. We need a revival, each of us, you, me. We need a revival in our own hearts. We need, we need to drop on our own knees and, 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 and repent, change, come back to God. Get serious again. You and I need to do that. And then we need to do that with our own family, with the ones that we're already in love with, our church family. We need to demonstrate love and appreciation to them as well. And then together, we need to reach out to the world in love with the message of peace. Okay, that's the end of our Bible study for today. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for thinking and praying with us. Right now, I'd like to conclude this with one more prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, we pray that you will fill our hearts not only with your spirit, but now because of your spirit with your love, with your peace, with your joy, with your kindness, with your gentleness, with your self-control. Develop in our hearts your fruit and help us to be like you, Lord Jesus, because we love you. We wanna be with you forever, but we wanna live with you and for you now. So we pray that you will help us to give their, your peace to this world, that we will be peacemakers in our own world and that it will spread throughout the entire planet because we walk with you, we love you, and we're surrendered to you. And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you again for being a part of this study.